Do you need wood? If so, please stop calling me Larry Woodstore. My last name just happens to be Woodstore, but not every Mr. Baker is a baker, and not every Mr. Woodstore owns a wood store. All right, my phone number is 832-746-WOOD because it's easy to remember. Also, I do own the website, woodforsale.com, which lets you browse a great selection of wood. Add wood to your shopping cart, fill out a billing address, click checkout. But that was just a project for my web design class. I like wood. I love web design. Doesn't mean I own a wood store. TBTL. I believe it was Benjamin Franklin who said, You have reached the end of your free trial membership at BenjaminFranklinQuotes.com. Here I've been talking with the most intelligent people in the world, and I never even noticed. Hoo-ha! 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 We are legitimate, and we're, we're, we're churning out mega, mega stars, and it's... It's a show that actually you see great things happen to these kids, and, and I love it. And I think that it's going to be around for a while. All right. Hello, good morning, and welcome, everyone, to a Tuesday edition of TBTL, the show just might be too beautiful to live. I heard about that thing on the AM radio. My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. It's a tuna, bro. Coming to you from the Madrona Hill broadcast studio perched high above the mighty Columbia, where you may already be able to uh, pick up in my voice that I am a little under the weather today. I, uh, battling some kind of a head cold type situation, had me up last night with a runny nose and congestion and discomfort. It was one of those things where I was, I was just uncomfortable enough that I couldn't get any good sleep, but not uncomfortable enough that I wanted to fully commit to going downstairs in the freezing cold house um, and getting like some kind of, uh, I don't even know what you take for that, cold and flu medicine or something. So uh, I'm going to try to get through today's show and uh, you're going to try to enjoy it. Nausea, cold sweats, hot sweats, involuntary trembling, dead hands, numb lips, fingernail sensitivity, pelvic discomfort. Those are just a few of the ailments I'm currently suffering from. Uh, this is episode 4,150 in a collector series. Let the fun begin. And uh, not only am I under the weather, but I'm <laughs> I'm attempting to do something that is right at the edge of my abilities. Not at the edge of the abilities of most people, but, but for me, it's been challenging. I am trying to put together uh, an entire kitchen that I had delivered yesterday from Ikea. Let's take on projects that we know we can't do and do them! You know, they, they don't bring you these cabinets fully assembled they um they're just in the boxes and then you they have names that i'm not familiar with and then you take them out and then you look at the directions and try to assemble them which is what i spent a lot of last night doing when i wasn't hacking up a lung uh we'll talk about that uh, we'll talk about at&t and what they think seven hours of you losing your cellular connection is worth to you the consumer Oh, and we'll talk to this guy, longest running Cobro of the show, maybe best known for his depictions of, well, I'll just let the tape tell you. Maybe best known for his depictions of the tall ships, capturing their grace and power. It's power. Okay, I'm going to really remember that next time. He's Andrew Walsh, and he's joining me right now. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Luke. That tape you played from, um, what about Bob? The uh, Uh cold sweats, the hot sweats, all that. Yeah. It reminded me of a cryptic email that I received last night that I'm not even sure. I'm honestly not even sure if I should bring this up on the show, and I'm not even spoofing when I say that. I'm quite That's serious. generally uh, means it's good content. That's a good content alert. I just don't want to put you on front street, oh. but I don't see how... I don't know what's going on here. Were you emailing with a listener about having a numb hand? Mm, unless I did it during some kind of Lunesta-inspired sleep mm-hmm. event, uh, or... Wait, did I have the colonoscopy yet? Yeah, is this the recovery room? Ask, Say something have... racist. <laughs> Make me mad. Listen to the listener at the end of yesterday's show if you want to know why Luke said that. Yeah, that's um, a callback. Um, so I, I, gonna... don't, I don't have any memory of, of uh, that conversation. Okay, I am going to read to you directly from an email that we both received, uh, let's see, uh, yesterday evening, a little before 9 p.m. I'm not going to say this listener's name because... Well, I'm just not going to say this listener's <laughs> name. Hey, you know, you don't have to explain Subject, why you're not going to say the listener's name. 
Subject line, 5% numb hand. Okay. Now, is this so far, any of this sound like something we've talked about on the show? Numb hands? No, I but, mean, you know, uh, what we do talk about on the show a lot is how bad our memories are. That's true. Um, so although I feel brains. less bad about it now because I was listening to Fresh Air last night. And uh, and Terry Gross was interviewing a memory expert who was. I actually thought of you, Andrew. I was like, I need to forward this to Andrew, mm. because what he was basically saying is that the fact that we all of us struggle sometimes to remember a specific name of someone or whatever does not necessarily indicate we're in cognitive decline. And he gave a really interesting and very comforting uh, sort of scientific and I guess neurologic explanation for what our brain is doing when we're trying when we're grasping for something like that, and it's not that we're not smart, it's not that we weren't paying attention, it's not that we're in mental decline, it's it's other stuff going on. I thought, I need to forward this to my friend Andrew. First of all, we, when you first said, I should forward this to you, I thought you meant because this guy was going to tell you how to remember things, you dingus. Um, but now that you describe what he was talking about, I think I heard the same fella on um, on the media. Was this sort of in the context of Joe Biden? Yes. He kind of messing up somebody's name? and a, you Well, know, he wrote an the- op-ed piece, I believe, uh, kind of addressing the Robert Hur report, which, mm-hmm. which, and 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 I believe his his assessment of of the way the report was written. He said he couldn't, you know, tell you specifics about Joe Biden. He hasn't had a chance to, you know, diagnose him or sit down with him. But he felt like the report was really off base, um, mm-hmm. based on what he knows about how human memory works and what he sees from Joe Biden. Um, and I just would when every time he said Joe Biden, I just and substituted Andrew Walsh. <laughs> right, and and the idea being that like. You know, calling the president of Mexico the president of Egypt is not the same thing as forgetting that there is a Mexico. Literally what he said. Literally what he must have written in the op-ed and then literally what he said to Terry Gross (laughs) and probably what he said to either Brooke Gladstone or the other new host of that show. Don't you feel, though, that people should hear the stuff filtered through us? Like, sure, he's got an op-ed. He's on various public radio shows. But the best thing is for you and I to try to recall with our bad brains. Oh, hey, I was Uh speaking of bad brains. I was reading you an email. 841. I thought you were talking night. about the musical work of Greg Graffin, <laughs> lead singer of Bad Brains. Oh, I see. Uh, 841 last How's night. How's that for passing a cognitive test? Remembering <laughs> yeah. the lead singer of Bad Brains. Yeah, but when you want it too bad, it's, it's <laughs> kind of a, is it a bell curve? Is that what I'm thinking of here? I'm not sure. When you start really also, pushing I don't. just... Bad all, brains information. Out I also there. don't think that that guy is the lead singer no. of Bad Brains. He's like a roadie. No, I think he's in a different band. Like okay. That. Anyway, keep going. All right, put that on ice for a second. Five percent numb hand is the subject line that came in at eight forty one last night, and then I don't know how to say this, but you've probably said it before on the show. Raynaud's syndrome? Question mark. Does that sound so? The email just begins with no introduction. Raynaud's syndrome, question mark. Fingers got pale and numb, question mark. Typing this through a migraine that makes it so I can't see. Typos, question mark. Sorry, it might be a HIPAA violation to include Andrew on this. Ha ha. I have no idea what that is referring to, but I sure hope that person is feeling better. Yes, I think so, too. Maybe that is the migraine that is uh, and, and possibly the migraine medication that is. But I, I was just so confused. I was like, I, what is the we weren't talking about any numbness on the show. Right. Or, again, like, again, I mean, I'm just know, the person. I'm yeah. the person who just misattributed Greg Graffin from uh, Bad Religion. Oh. To the band Bad Brains, so I don't think I'm really here to weigh in on uh, what if we talked about numbness of the hands or not. Okay. Anyway, well, there you go. I hope that person is feeling better, and um, I don't think you broke any HIPAA violations, unless you no. and Luke. I thought maybe you were. I literally thought that like maybe you were having an email with a listener, and then they decided to loop me in at the end. They BCC'd me uh, at the end, but I guess not. No, I'm not very. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm I'm not as uh, up to speed on the TBTL email account that as I should be so the chances of me I mean it does happen but the chances of me and a listener interacting directly out of your earshot is Mm -hmm. uh is 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 typically not the case and then looping me in at the end there yeah Uh -uh. so anyway well that's what I got going on I got a bigger problem than anything you could even imagine right now Andrew which is I have a blackberry seed lodged in have you noticed that I've been working this toothpick really hard. Yeah, I saw you. You're kind of really um, digging away over there. I have. But it's not one of your little picks. It's not one of your flossy picks, right? It's just a toothpick. It's just a regular toothpick. Um, I've actually expanded that uh, whole universe, by the way. My um, things that I jam into my mouth to try to mm-hmm. keep my oral hygiene at its peak. Um, 
I picked up these things that uh, the Becca just had them sitting around her house. They're called like doctor. They're like a doctor's floss brushes. Are you have you familiar with this product? I don't think so. No, these things have absolutely changed my life of late. They're plastic, and one end is you know just kind of a pointy kind of uh, but, but but flexible little I don't know what you'd call it kind of almost blade that you can put in between your teeth. But the other side of these things is a very very fine and tiny brush, like something a microscopic chimney sweep might use mm, a tiny tiny chimney sweep it's like, so mm -hmm. it's so it's like honey i shrunk the dick van dyke mm -hmm. and it, it's so the brush is so um it's so tiny that you can literally brush it in between your teeth in the in you know between your teeth and your gums it is so much more i mean i'm also doing the floss picks but it is so much more satisfying than floss because the floss is one kind of experience, but these brushes, it's like, or have you ever, here's exactly what it's like. Have you ever cleaned out a dryer vent with one of those brushes that you put on a long snaking? No, but you know? I would love to do that. Oh, I would love to do how that. How has so this not much. come up on Spotless? This is one of the most cathartic. It's a big project because what you're doing is you're pushing out the lint that has collected in the you know, like the pipe or whatever, the venting that's going out from the dryer out of your house somewhere. Sometimes that can be kind of a long thing depending on how your walls are set up, et cetera. So they make these, these, it's, you know, it's just a round brush that's on the end of like, you screw together this black, uh, this plastic, very flexible, like, you know, piping. And then you just push, push, push. And then all of a sudden this massive thing of lint and whatever goes out the vent. It is just phenomenal. Do you know this is that of teeth? One of the most disappointing moments of my life, and there've been many, yeah. was when we moved into this house and we were having a lot of issues with our dryer. Now it was an old dryer, it's on its last legs. We knew we had to replace it, but I also was convinced that uh, that like um, the problem was being exacerbated by a buildup of lint. I just got it in my head that that must be it, both in the machine and in for our in our case, it's a very short tube that goes out the back of the machine and then out the wall. Luckily, mm -hmm. um, and so. I remember, I think I might have even been recording Spotless with Hannah and then had this idea, well, you know what, that dryer's probably working overtime because they probably never cleaned out that tube, that duct work, right? Yeah. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to clean it out from the, from the outside in and the inside out. Um, and so I take it all apart. And it was just clean as a whistle. Oh. Fine as a dandy. And I was just like, this is one moment where I wanted a mess. I wanted right. it to be so messy. Because you wanted an so explanation for the out. problem. Exactly. And it said it was just really nice in there. <laughs> You're like, thanks a lot, previous tenants or yeah. maybe previous owner. This was the thing you decided to focus on. <laughs> right. The one thing that right. could have helped me. But I may be a person, Andrew, who can just no longer be trusted to eat blackberries. Because this is this is what happened. You know, I've got that colonoscopy coming up. Oh, um, yeah, you can't eat blackberries, huh? Soon, but I'm trying to really, you know, while I can't. I literally had this thought in the store the other day. I was getting some blueberries. They had some, there were some blackberries right next to it. I'm trying to eat more healthy stuff, and I'm trying to keep it around my house more so that when I'm feeling snackish or I want something sweet, I go grab a handful of blueberries instead of um, a free chocolate bar from Alaska Airlines for being gold 75K. I never told you the worst part of remember when I was flying back from Las Vegas, not this most recent trip, but um, it was when I was doing the story about the city of Las Vegas and the Super Bowl and everything, Wayne Newton. And I told you how I got on the airplane and a guy got on the plane and had too large of a pack to fit in the overhead or under his seat. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to switch seats with me so he could put it in this sort of weird area that existed near my seat. And I don't like doing that and I was particularly put off because I realized that he had been there for a gun show. Yeah. He had with this military style backpack. In fact, a lot of the people on the flight, I realized I started looking around and it was like, Oh my God, these are all, these are all gun people. The part about the story I forgot to tell you was because we switched seats, I'm sitting there and the flight attendant comes over and hands him a chocolate bar and says, thank you so much for flying with us because she thought he was me. God. Wait, because of your, it wasn't, Oh, that's right. I was going to say it's not because he was in the military. He wasn't in the military. He was in some sort of paramilitary, it sounds like. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know what yeah. his military status was. 
at all, but they thought he was me. They, they gave him the chocolate bar. I know this because when I fly on Alaska Airlines, if I am not upgraded, this is how they work it out. If you are not luckily, uh, lucky enough to be put at the front of the plane through like an upgrade, if you're in coach, if you are forced to fly coach with the hoi polloi, they give you a chocolate bar as a thank you for your service to their oh, airplane company. And so I see. this guy just thought, cool. I guess they're just mm. giving out chocolate bars on this flight. And I just didn't even want to get into it. Yeah, I didn't want right. to go. I mean, what would you do? I mean, that would Oh, be I considered it. Just snatch it. I, would, I was about to go, that's supposed to be for me, <laughs> Wayne LaPierre. <laughs> I mean, but could you imagine? That was like, the, that was the, actually the cherry on top of that story was I had to move seats, which I hate doing. I had to move seats to accommodate a guy and the very pack was probably full of gun-related literature. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was, I, I don't think he had weapons on him. I don't think he's allowed to. But like, I, I saw that backpack as related to the situation. And in all of that, he then gets a free chocolate bar this would be better if he also then like then like somebody sits down next to him and it ends up being the love of his life and it could, <laughs> you can just totally see <laughs> your a real sliding doors situation or Jingle a, all the maybe, door. maybe an, a, 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 an inflatable tube situation in this case hey can i ask you a question about yeah. airplane etiquette because yeah. a friend of ours I was continue um, working posted, on this blackberry seed posted something on instagram today sounding a little bit put out it sounds like our friend who will remain nameless and might be the person who sent in that email before, <laughs> was sitting uh, in the window seat on a mm. flight today or last night. Uh -huh. uh, it must have been today because I think it was a light issue. And the person who's sitting either in the middle seat or the aisle seat asked him, hey, can you close that shade? Where are you uh, yeah. on that? If you're the window seat person, do you have to take orders from the other person in the row about nope. the status of the shade? No, nope, But what do, do you do that? Well, then what do you do? How do you how do you decline that request? I think you say, oh, I just really love looking out the window, mm -hmm. which is I've actually said that to people because I really love looking out the window. And one of the main reasons that I try to get the window seat is because I like to just stare out the window at, you know, the amber waves of grain at like whatever like i'm I, I don't care what it is that's happening outside i find it visually interesting and um and i i think that the acknowledged the acknowledged rules of the air are the window seat is the captain of the window they have the captain of how the window relates to that row and the opposite is sometimes that's what true. you should say you should say i'm the captain of the window uh-huh because like that goes over because like I uh, have had the opposite happen many a time where, um, you know, we're taking off and I'm maybe in the aisle seat or the middle seat or whatever. And the person on the window just shuts it and just like starts staring at their screen or goes to sleep or something. And I that bums me out because I'd like to be able to see what's going on outside. I find it, as I said, interesting. I also and I. But you respect their status as captain of the window. Exactly. I, you yeah. know, I, I, the, the, them's the rules. But I, that then, but I do judge them. Now, sleeping is one thing. Okay, sleeping is, in fact, Becca and I were flying from Vegas on Saturday. So her brother's birthday was on Friday. He turned fifty. Jeff. We had a wonderful time uh, for a couple of days in Las Vegas. But of course, my mom was turning seventy, and my sister was turning forty on Saturday. This, a mere week after my daughter turned 30, I was like, can we agree to not have any more gigantic birthdays, please, for a little while? This is really, this is a lot of pressure. But we, so we got up early on Saturday morning in Las Vegas and flew to Seattle to go to this birthday get together for my sister and my mom. And I was in the middle seat, Becca was on the window, and I was a little bit, uh, you know, tired from we got up early. And I know we had the window open, but what I noticed was, well, sometimes she would move, she would inadvertently move her body in front of the window and it would, it would like, you know, cut the light off and it was so much easier to sleep. And then she would move back and they'd be like, oh, I, I had a sort of retroactive uh, sympathy for people that are trying to sleep maybe on an early flight and they want to shut the window. Maybe it's helping them sleep. That's one thing. Here's what I don't get. And here's where I get really judgy on people. We're on an airplane. It's taking off. The person on the window just shuts the shade and then just stares into the middle distance or just stares at their phone or whatever. And I want to say, is your life this interesting that it does not fascinate you that we are in an aluminum tube 30,000 feet above the earth, that we are doing something 
that less than 1% of the entirety of the human population has ever had a, a chance to do. We're flying over Mount Rainier. We are flying over, we are, we are currently touching down in Frankfurt, Germany, whatever it is. Like, the, the, the idea that a person would just be uninterested in that, not sleepy, not like needing to close the shade because they're tired and it helps with the light, that I kind of get more now and more so now than ever. But if you're just closing it because you're like, that's not something I'm interested in, we're flying by the Grand Canyon, eh, what have you done for me lately, Colorado River? Like, I don't understand that kind of person. Hmm. I... I, I I would be less judgy myself on that. I just think it's people have various sensitivities to light or whatever. Sometimes it's just comfortable to like not have, if you do want to look at your phone, not have that glare. But I, I dig what you're saying. But I have a question for you going back to the etiquette thing. If you are, let, let's say that you have the window open and maybe you don't care. And maybe I'm just digging too deep into this. But let's just say you have the window open. But you're not actively looking out the window in that moment. But you might be glancing from time to time. You just like the experience of having it open yeah. or having the shade open. But the person happens to like kind of ask you in a moment where you've been looking at your phone or uh -huh. your device or looking down. And now they say, hey, would you mind closing that? And you're like, you know what? I really like looking out the window. Do you now feel more pressure to not look down at your phone and instead like <laughs> sort of more almost performatively or you mean, actively look out the touch, window? Touch the tips of both <laughs> yeah. fingers. I was actually fingers literally together doing going, that while going, I was talking. Ah. <laughs> yes, I do. I absolutely feel that pressure. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't know if that particular scenario has unfolded for me, but I will tell you that if it did, that's how I would feel. I yeah, would then to be like, I would now... be basking in the majesty of Tulsa, Oklahoma by night. Yeah, right. Yes. And I say that with peace and love to our listeners in Tulsa. But oh, yeah. look at the top of that wing. God, that's a yeah. good wing. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, this is some good staring, my friends. <laughs> no, but I have this one and then we can move on from this. But I have this one like. The my very back top, I guess, molar on the left on the left side has a little space in it. And it's not, you know, it's not a cavity. It's not anything that is um, needs dental attention. It's just the way my tooth is shaped. There's just a little kind of pit in it that if I eat anything with seeds, inevitably a seed ends mm -hmm. up in there and it's exactly the size the hole the opening is about exactly the size of a blackberry seed and every time i eat blackberries this happens and it's a good two days of worrying this thing with my tongue and other implements before it finally comes out and when i finally get it out it's such a relief and i think i gotta not eat blackberries i gotta chew them on the other side or something but here mm -hmm. i am once again get yourself a tooth it. condom <laughs> you just put it on before you eat the berries. We've been giving this medicine to Professor Bananas, which I think I might have. Professor Bananas, by the way, is my dad. Uh, no, our, <laughs> our, our our older cat uh, who's been a little bit sick lately. And I but think doing I a little better. Uh, as of last last night was like the first night where it started to seem like things might go back to normal, which oh, is good. good. Like so, yeah, it's been kind of a long, kind of exhausting two weeks okay. of kind of looking at this cat. And also, Veeves and I are supposed to be living leaving on a trip pretty soon, mm -hmm. a little bit, a little vacay. And so the. I mean, I, I know how privileged that sounds like get better cat so we can go on vacation without feeling guilty. But like everything has been so up in the air and having to keep the two cats separate in the house and not knowing like maybe instead of our friends watching, do we have to get more of a caregiver? Like, can we both even go on this trip? It's been a lot of a lot of questions. So we were pretty relieved last night that if things continue to go in this direction, we should be uh, all set. And hopefully bananas is feeling better and, and she's been very cute with us. And so hopefully she's getting back to normal. But we've been administering this um i would say like a it's a medicine that spurs her appetite it's mm. like an appetite um stimulant know, stimulant yeah and it's strange though because we apply it to her inner ear <laughs> and i've heard this from other um people as well like i, I thought the i thought that because we were also giving her some anti-nausea medicine i'm like well that i could see going in the ear because you know inner ear stuff like balance equilibrium like, yeah exactly but no that's not it it's the appetite stimulant that goes in the ear and what we have to do is you take a little tube of it it's like a tiny it's like a mini little tube of toothpaste that would be the perfect size for your mini toothbrushes actually but don't put this stuff in your mouth and you're supposed to um there's a little guide on the 
box that says draw a line on your finger about this long. And so you're supposed to draw a little like line of this medicine of this kind of this little gel on your finger, a very thin line, and then you rub it on her inner ear. But you're not supposed to just use your regular finger because God knows where your finger's been, right? So uh-huh. it also comes with these little finger condoms that you have to put on your finger. And honestly, <laughs> that, that that's my least favorite part. It makes me very self-conscious and uncomfortable putting on finger condoms. Don't put anything smaller than your elbow in your cat's ear. <laughs> that's is, what they say. That's that is really say. surprising that it, the application is in her ear. Have you considered yeah, trying it on yourself? Strange. Just I'm putting uh, just, it in my ear to yeah, see. Yeah, just it to is see true. what I it should. does. I should eat more. That's the one thing that the doctor always tells me. Yeah, right. You're dangerously underweight. <laughs> right. All right. Let's, uh, we got some dazzling donors to thank. And then I do want to tell you about my new favorite content creator, Andrew, who I've spent a lot of time with in the last, I don't know, 24 hours. So uh, let's do that. We was hoping for some razzle dazzle. Razzle dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle dazzle. On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. All right, let's thank some dazzling donors. These are the generous folks who are dazzling us with a donation of dough each month, and we are exceedingly grateful for that. It's how we can do the show. And and thanks to the the generosity and the support of these people, I feel, Andrew, a personal responsibility to take to the airwaves even on days like today when I'm battling a variety of illnesses as previously demonstrated in the uh, audio from What About Bob? Mm-hmm. Just I, dedicated to the craft. I am. For the love mm-hmm. of the game and for the love of Jill Jarris, uh, who's in Lakewood, Ohio. Jill! My old stomping grounds of Lakewood, Ohio. And my and new I stomped, man. My, my, stomped my new stomping grounds of knowing how to say Jill's last name. Yes! So it says it rhymes with Harris or Ferris. So it's Jill Jarris. I think we've gotten that wrong probably every dang time. Prior I believe to this. I've been saying Jill Jarro. Oh, really? Going for the French? Kind of something, anyway. Uh, Jill, thank you. All you have to do, I just want to mention, if you would like us to pronounce your name correctly, is go ahead and hit us up at the Dazzling Donor level where there is (laughs) (laughs) like an input for the pronunciation of your name. Jill says, hey, friendos, longtime donor, first-time Dazzler. Congratulations for going independent and ensuring TBTL keeps making hashtag content that makes me feel less lonely in the world. Mm. Aw, Jill. Congratulations to you on us and finally knowing how to say your name. Yeah. Uh, when I'm anxious or frazzled, TBTL is there to delve into the minutia of life. Well, Jill, you cr- obviously when you wrote this, you hadn't heard today's show where I was picking a blackberry seed out of my teeth. Minutia? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> that word, it does not mean what you think it means. I'm, we get to the universal through the deeply uh-huh. personal, okay? Uh-huh. That's what and we do deeply here. deeply embedded seed. <laughs> uh, and it really helps. Thank you. I'd also like to remind everyone... Uh, that it's an Olympic and Paralympic year if you love the games. I invite you to listen to my podcast called Keep the Flame Alive, a weekly show about the games. During Paris 2024, we'll have daily coverage. We're accredited media and will bring the excitement of Paris directly to you. Note, uh, Luke and Andrew, you have money worries. Try being an indie podcast with a very expensive trip every two years. Holy smokes, so Jill. So they're traveling to cover the Paralympics. Bro, we need to have them on. Yeah, that sounds cool. I am a big, uh, a, well, I, particularly the summer games. I get really into them. I can feel this is a year I'm going to get into the summer games. The TBTL summer games? or the, No, no, the those I actually could take or leave. Okay, gotcha. But the, the Olympics and the Paralympics, like certain years... Uh, or certain times around, you know, because obviously these are things that happen every two years, the winter and then the summer. Um, I remember when it used to be every four years and then that year had both of them, and I just couldn't handle that dry spell in between. Much. Oh, I thought you couldn't handle the deluge. No, I loved the deluge. I wanted, mm. to be, I wanted there to be the Olympics every single year. I was a kid who really watched the Olympics and was really into it because it's just good television. Like, they, they are... They've really kind of dialed in the storytelling aspect of it. Um, but um, then they switched it to where you never had to wait four years. You only have to wait two years. It and, does make sense in that way. But I'm also, yeah, I'm, I'm, I I'm, could see this. I mean, it's Paris, which is so cool. Um, like, I could see this being... The other thing that happens for me with the Olympics is if I have a contact point, if there's a particular athlete that I've taken an interest in or a sport, 
fact, I'm going to be working on a TV story about break dancing, which is now going to be an Olympic sport. I believe I'm going to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado to watch some break dancers. Um, but anyway, I, if I get if I get kind of interested early on a particular Olympics, be it winter or summer, then I just kind of every becomes my like default TV watching that night. Um, there's just something very the pageantry of it all and everything I like. And now I like that we have a ten Jill Jarris who's going to be in Paris. Hey, it's Jill Jarris from Paris. <laughs> I wonder if Jill's thought of that. I don't know. I mean, we have some branding opportunities. Did you know that in, in I think, I think it's this year's like games in Paris that they're adding a um, Desperate Housewives quiz as one of the events? <laughs> I think the TBTL Summer Games are actually having an impact on the Olympic Summer Games. That's kind of cool. Like, yeah, although Knowing it's... that we're kind of impacting it's, the culture. It's tough, though, because we have to embargo. What we try to do is we don't want to ruin it for the evening broadcast of uh -huh. the TBTL Summer Games. So we hope that people won't like listen early. And then that was a complicated and kind of nonsensical joke about when the Olympics is in a place where the timing is really funky for America. Right. And I was like, going to ask you how you feel about that, though, because you and I love live broadcasting and there does seem something uh, like old fashioned about the NBC network clinging to like trying to like not spoil it and time shift the games and everything. Right. In the modern world. Yeah, there's versions of it. So, I mean, the the games are going to be in Los Angeles at some point in the not too distant future. That'll be obviously a slam dunk. And then there's like Paris. OK, uh, it'll be it's going to be t delayed by probably seven or eight hours then there's other ones where it's happening at four in the morning mm -hmm. you know and that one like sometimes it gets really really out of whack um where again i don't i'm not a jill jarris on this i don't follow it this closely but there are years where there have been years where like the results are coming in and you're seeing it in like on cnn.com and you were planning on watching it that night but you're already finding out what like the the u.s mm -hmm. women's soccer team did Right, and like, exactly. And you're like, oh, man, I was taping that. Right, so. and then it, well, NBC was taping that for me. Exactly, so, yeah. I was trying yeah. to avoid it. Anyway, Jill says, I love the Olympics because they encourage excellence, and they're one of the few events that brings the world together in peace. If you've never watched the Paralympics, do. The athleticism is amazing, and it's what's, uh, it's what's possible when people adapt. You can find our pod at flamealivepod.com. Uh, on your app, flamealivepod.com, or your app, excuse me, or your app. So um, go check out uh, go check out flamealivepod.com, the podcast that listener Jill is doing from Paris. And by the way, Jill, if you hadn't have thought of I'm Jill Jarris from Paris, mm -hmm. you're welcome. <laughs> you're a Jurisian. <laughs> Maestro? On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. We've also got to thank Angela Barrera in Corpus Christi, Texas. Body of Christ. Cheers. <laughs> um, you brought it up. By saying Corpus Christi? I mean, I just mean Angela brought it up. It seemed weird for me to say Body of Christ, but I mean, I it didn't, is, it I is didn't the bring town. it into evidence. Yeah. I've had some fun times in Corpus Christi. In the early days of Becca and I dating, like very, like too early, I happened to have a work trip for Texas scheduled, doing some sort of filming, I think, and other things down there. Well, it was just filming. It wasn't other things. And uh, I said, hey, do you want to go on a, do you want to go on a trip? And she was like, um, that sounds like a questionable idea. Sure. And so we went down there and I remember driving to Corpus Christi. Um, I wanted to find somewhere warm. It was, you know, it was a, it was the winter time still. And I wanted to find somewhere warm and, and Corpus Christi was uh, the a place that, that, promised to be kind of relatively warm it's kind of down there on the gulf coast and uh my god we drove through a hailstorm to get there that was unlike anything hail and rain rain to a degree that it was like every car had their if a car was trying to drive they had their hazards on and most cars had pulled over mm -hmm. like not even pacific northwest like boy it's one of those crummy days where there's a lot of water kicking up on i-5 this was like you know this is a, a, an incredibly stressful situation to be driving in a rental car with a person who you aren't, have not been dating very long and trying to show courage under fire. And um, 
we got through it just fine. I, I handled it relatively okay. Becca didn't freak out. Like she was like, you're, you're going to kill us. And I did, you know, it was a, it was a bonding experience early on. And I thank Angela Barrera and the weather patterns of Corpus Christi, Texas. Do you remember, and I'm not trying to compete with your memories with Becca, but do you remember um, when you and I, I think we were on a trip where we rented that <laughs> When you and Becca RV. were on a trip? Remember when Becca and I were on a trip? Um, no, you and I were, and again, it was in Texas. Why are we we're going, we go to Texas, we get assaulted by the weather because you and I were in an RV and we were so close to our final destination after <gasps> driving all the way from Seattle yeah. down to Austin. And we were probably like a half hour away from How our destination. How did we swung by our- like the Lyndon John? Johnson, like birthplace of Lyndon Johnson or something. I feel like we were coming in via a historic oh, town on the outskirts of Austin. I don't remember that detail, but then the hail we were, started. We were somewhere near Austin when the hail began to take hold. Whoa. And I started to get really nervous. I'm like, this is going to cause damage to this. <laughs> like, yeah. what, is, what is our responsibility for this RV? Because like, it was like, yeah, like things were cracking down on the yes. windshield and on the roof of this RV. I mean, it was so, we pulled over and just sat at the side oh, of the road yeah. for maybe 10 minutes or something while yeah. we were just pelted with like golf balls. I had totally forgotten about that, but yes, I remember that. And Oof. I remember being like, did I get the insurance for that? Right, exactly. I think I probably did because it was APM that was funding. Yeah. What I could say now is if it was a TBTB production, <laughs> questionable at best. That's why it's up to you and John to really look out for this operation now. Um, Angela says, hola, friendos. I couldn't help but take a bet on Luke and Andrew as they embarked with John on this new phase of TBTL by stepping up my donation to the dazzling level. Wow, thanks, Angela. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate that. I've been a listener since the beginning as a carryover from the BPP days. Wow, Bryant Park. Angela, I don't even know how Angela heard about the Bryant Park project. I did not realize we were trending in Corpus Christi, Texas, or wherever Angela may have been at the time. Yeah, wow. We were on, I believe, one radio station that was in, like, Vermont. Wait, really? Aside from NYC? We weren't, on, been on it. we weren't on NYC. That was the problem. Really? The, I didn't know. But did I only? Li- I must have only listened to that show online. Yeah, we 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 might have. No, I don't even think we were on the AM. Ver- we might have been on the AM version of WNYC. Not mm. the like the. You know, they had a couple of frequencies, mm. and we might have been on like a sub 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 frequency of theirs we weren't on the big show because that would have meant they stopped playing morning edition for us which, oh that's right you're it was supposed to be an alternate to that it was supposed right? to be an alternative yeah. morning edition yeah. which was which was madness if you think it was morning yeah. edition is probably the most popular program on any public radio station which station is going to swap that out for 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 me and allison stewart and uh, Win Rosenfeld on the ones and twos. Yeah, it would have to be. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, they must have been looking at like maybe markets with a second station so that they could provide alternate. And it's interesting, too, because it's not even like competition from coming across the street. It's it's internal competition. They're like, we have the most popular radio program yeah. in the world. Let's create some internal competition for it. See if we can get stations to swap it out. What an interesting. I interesting think they gambit. also just didn't understand at the time how big on demand was going to be. Mm. Which, I mean, mm-hmm. no one understood how big On Demand was going to be. Like, by that, I mean podcasting and stuff. But what happened was that show, The Bryant Park Project, was a pretty big failure because we were trying to... Everybody had to be there at 4 in the morning to make sure this show was going live at 6 a.m. for one station in Vermont. <laughs> I mean, literally. This, it it's, was it's, While Steve Zind gets ready for his air shift exactly. on Vermont Public Radio. And, like, I don't even think we were on Vermont Public Radio. I think we were odd, you know. Like, again, like a, a some kind of... Maybe we replaced one hour of, Amy, of Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman or something. But... Um, I just hope there's one person out there who enjoyed my Steve Zind joke. I bet you there's a lot of people. We've got a lot of li- <laughs> it's a this small show. State. <laughs> this show has a lot of listeners in Vermont, and I'm sure yeah. that they're all high fiving each other right now. <laughs> yeah. But um, primarily Steve Zind. But yeah. uh, but they were spending on that show. I forget what the number was, but I want to say it was in the neighborhood of twenty or thirty thousand dollars a month just on car on cab fare, because we had to get in so early that the subways didn't operate yet mm. at that hour of the morning, and it was obviously unsafe. For people to be, you know, walking or uh, I don't know if it was unsafe or not, but NPR had made the decision that in order to minimize their legal risk, everyone that worked on the show got a basically town car escort into work. 
Good grief. You had people that I think the majority of the money being paid to them was in town car services. Um, anyway, it was, it was a bad idea all around. But, Andrew, here's the thing. It hooked Angela Barrera in That's to right. TBTL. And here we are. How many years later? Many years later. And Angela Barrera of Corpus Christi is sponsoring the show. She says, thank you so much, team, for all the content, companionship, and comedy through the years. Good luck to all. And please, more Star Trek references. Kapla? That is obviously a Klingon word that means... God, I hope it's not Spanish or you are... Big time coming out of a colonoscopy. It means uh, it's something that you yell victoriously after your oh. first uh, full conversation with a Klingon. Whoa. Success. I see. Okay. It means, it means success. Um, that's uh, that's good. That's all the Klingon I now speak is Kapla. Yeah. I wonder if Angela is um, aware of listener Navia's uh, thorough exploration of the Star Trek yeah, universe. Yeah, exactly. Check that out on YouTube. Because I follow her on Instagram now, and I get to see a lot of, like, I'm going to be honest with you, I still don't get most of the references, but that's like mm -hmm. being a new TBTL listener. You don't exactly. get most of the references, but you just like the hang. Exactly. Right? I feel the same way. Well, thank you to our dazzling donors for making TBTL possible today. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. So I, uh, I got that kitchen. I keep saying a kitchen delivered. I mean, the appliances were already here, Andrew, but um, all of the cabinets that I ordered through Ikea, which is a pretty uh, actually complicated process involving a lot of like geometry and measuring and stuff and floor plans and the like. And then they just put it into this big, very complicated system. And then it's kind of a supply chain deal where it starts just like every day I'm getting a note from Ikea going, you're, you know, such and such is out for delivery today because of the vagaries of, of how this stuff works now. It's all coming from different. Some of it's coming from FedEx. And then one panel will be coming from like I yesterday, right when the show ended, I had a truck pull up and these two really nice gentlemen were unloading a bunch of stuff. A different truck pulled up, different guy, someone who's I think probably a freelancer uh, who gets, you know, hired a contractor gets hired by by logistics companies. He just had a different stuff, a bunch of stuff from Ikea. It's all for the same kitchen. Two different trucks. The guys don't know each other mm -hmm. to deliver different like pieces of cabinet and things like that. It's a very, it's the, the logistics. Did they become friends? They did speak Spanish to each other whilst in the house. I did know it that. And I was like, these are pro very likely some guys who have had somewhat similar life experiences of doing this kind of work and whatever. So I kind of dug that they were comparing notes. The mm -hmm. first two guys kind of laughed when the other guy pulled up because then they were everybody were all like it was sort of like the two Spider-Men pointing at each other. <laughs> right. Now there are two of us. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? Right. The guys. So it was, like, it was a good vibe out here. But it's just it's just so strange how that all works now. You know, it, like how that makes sense. The other thing was. The, when I was out of town, you know, and I put up that whole awning situation to try to protect the original stuff that was going to show up, which was just a cabinet or two, um, those cabinets, when I opened them, that were sent via FedEx that I had to pay $75 of shipping out of my own pocket for, which seems like a bad system, because it was like they were kept somewhere else by Ikea where they could not be put on one of those trucks. The corners were all bashed up mm. which was really frustrating mm. and i call ikea and they're just like yeah we're just sending you another one no cost to you just keep the ones that are broken oh i'm sorry so the actual corners of the cabinetry were busted up i thought you meant of the box and it made you nervous but no you actually no. had damaged goods and huh? what you learn about this ikea stuff is it's you know mm -hmm. it's <laughs> It's 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 medically fragile from a starting mm -hmm. point. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's particle board or press board or whatever we call it now. And it's like it doesn't take a whole lot. So what happened was peace and love to the FedEx guy. But he was probably like, oh, this is heavy. I'm carrying it down these stairs. Conk, just like put it mm -hmm. down in a way that just bunged the corner. So as I was opening this stuff, it'd be like fine, fine, fine. And then the corner would just be like completely destroyed. Oh. So I called Ikea expecting this to be a complete nightmare. So easy. They were like, OK. Do, 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 do. We're sending you a new one, March 4th. And I was like, what do I do with the old one? I'll just throw it out, whatever. And then I'm like, okay, well, this is definitely makes sense from a financial standpoint. Right, like, yeah. You yeah. charged me, I had to pay the $75 the first time around to get this thing specially sent up from like Sacramento or something. But now you're just on my, on my honor, 
which I have very little of, <laughs> listeners would know, on my honor, you're now just resending these things to me at no cost. Okay. All right, IKEA. And now you're selling slightly used IKEA. That's furniture. what I'd like to that's mostly what I'd like to talk about today is I've recently come into possession of some scratch and dent IKEA material. I was about to ask you about scratch and dent, if you don't mind, a quick aside, because um, that term came up on the Spotless podcast recently, and Hannah and I were unfamiliar with the term scratch and dent, and I was about to ask you, you know, you grew up in a pretty thrifty family. Was that a big part of your culture, scratch and dent? Absolutely. Well, uh, and also just the scratch and dent section of... Mm larger stores that weren't overall a discount store. So my uncle Mike worked at a place that used to be called Jaffco. And then later it was, the name was changed to best. Just best. It's a interesting naming convention, but it was basically like a electronics store. It's not related. I I was confused. Not best buy. There's a Jaffco plumbing in the area. That's probably just a coincidence. Probably no yeah. no connection. No there. connection. This okay. place, was, as far as I was also very young at the time, but sure. what I remember was it was down, I think, in South Center, and my sense was it was a, like kind of an electronics type of deal, like what we think of maybe as a sort of a Best Buy or maybe an appliance store of some kind. What I know was we did not. It took us a long time to get a microwave in the Burbank family, mm-hmm. and finally there was a microwave that was scratch and dent. That I think my Uncle Mike might have seen, scratch and dent at best. I was going to say, how scratched, how dented? Uh, it's fairly dented on the side. I'm sure Walt did some kind of, you know, popping out of mm-hmm. whatever the metal was. But that was how we got our microwave. And I remember that being a really feeling like a big day in the Burbank household. Like, we had a microwave, but it was because of scratch and dent. So we were, yeah, I was very aware of, like, the idea of scratch and dent as a kid. It seems like a microwave... Let's let's just make sure the things that close are closed. You know what I mean? Like, do you do you want do you want radiation? I don't know how microwaves work. Never mind. I was just gonna say, like, you just want to make sure that that bad boy's sealed up, right? Before we hit go on it, we hope it's not so dented that the seal is broken. It's leaking. Yeah, it's right. Not you're staring. Leaking. It's overflowing. You're staring at your hot dogs cooking while your brain scrambles. Um. So it's. I have so much to say on this, and we don't have endless time today, but the, the, the long and the short of it is, much has been made of IKEA's system for um, uh, kind of, um, what am I trying to say? IKEA's system of, of, of having furniture that can be assembled uh, independent of language, yeah. independent of a background in like furniture construction, Kind of like their whole thing is that they, and they've had many years to perfect this now. This idea of, ma- of basically making something with the, with the tools, both to assemble it and also the hardware that holds it all together. That theoretically, you could, you could drop it into a fairly evolved uh, community of chimps. A la when that big monolith drops in 2001. I guess those were maybe cave people or something, but like, like the idea is that like almost anyone could do this, and and I've put together IKEA furniture before. My buddy Cotter used to say the first piece of direction should be open a beer, <laughs> be like you're gonna be here for a while. But I've never really tried to put together something on the scale of this kitchen. And what I will tell you is that they have not perfected the directions. I know complaining about IKEA and the assembly is this is not novel content, but. I was really struck anew last night at how kind of actually not easy it is. And the drawings at time, the illustrations, which, which again are purely visual. There were so many times where I, like, you know, I have to use glasses now when I'm looking at stuff like that. I was literally like looking at it, like it would be like these wood pegs, right? That you kind of tap into these series of pre-drilled holes. The problem is there are six pre-drilled holes on one of the edges of this cabinet. And there's three pegs that need to go in and they're kind of telling you which of the six, you know, of the six holes, which three need the pegs because the other ones need something else. Yep. But the actual illustration of it is shockingly small and actually kind of in the background. Like it's, I should actually take a picture and send it to you. Yeah, please do. Like I was going, are they like, this seems like a critical thing. I, how is this not like it needed to be much more explicit than it was. And what I realized is, I am not alone in this. There's a whole genre on YouTube 
of people putting together IKEA furniture, and in particular IKEA kitchens, because of how unhelpful the directions from IKEA actually are. That makes a lot of sense because those directions, is, since they've been trying to make them universal, which has been the totality of my experience with IKEA stuff, in trying to make the instructions universal, it makes it harder for everyone to follow a little bit. You know what I mean? Like everybody yes. can follow it eventually, but it's a more difficult process because of the because of the lack of language, right, or a specific language. So it makes sense. Like I mean, the majority of things I go to fix around the house, my very first stop these days is YouTube uh -huh. University, right? Like yeah. that's that's cliche at this point as well. I was thinking that maybe this would have been a good opportunity for IKEA to sort of like say, you know what, we'll make the videos, we'll produce slick little videos because that's the best way to actually show people how to get these things made. But I guess if you have an entire community of YouTubers out there doing it for free, you don't need IKEA to do their own specifically branded ones. I don't you know. You know, it may just be that these people have better uh, search engine optimization. Mm. It may just be that a guy named Ranz, who I've been watching, Mm -hmm. Just has better SEO than IKEA because my the beginning of the journey was IKEA kitchen assembly or whatever. But this guy's voice is so soothing, Andrew. Mm. Like this is my new favorite radio host, even though this is more, I guess, video. But take a listen to this dude. So in this video, I'm going to tell you about four or five things you need to pay attention to if you're installing the suspension rail and using the uh, instruction that comes with the rail because uh, it's not all good. So uh, <laughs> keep watching. That and uh, while we add it, please uh, subscribe to my channel right there. It's, uh, it's not all very good. It's not all very good. <laughs> Rans is a guy, I don't even know where he is in the world, but he has basically figured out that like there are a lot of things about the IKEA kitchen assembly that just don't even work in a normal house. Like, uh, the fact that, well, I'll just have him kind of pick it up here. Before we get to the topic of this video, I just... Oh, by the way, I love this too. <laughs> this is a warning about literally lacerating your leg with some of the IKEA material. Rons has included a photo of a major gash on his leg. Oh, geez. Or as he describes it, a gap that happened mm -hmm. from this IKEA kitchen assembly. Before we get to the topic of this video, I just want to share a warning with you because uh, a few years back I was not paying attention while hanging the rail and while I was handling it uh, in order to cut um, the rail in two I uh, hit my shin and as you can see in this picture it uh, left quite a big um, of a gap on my uh, leg there and I had to go to the emergency room to have eight stitches uh, to close up that uh, wound and a big band-aid on and uh, I don't want this to happen to you so please pay attention when you're handling the rail really good advice Rand. are you developing a parasocial relationship with him? Uh, hugely mm -hmm. because he points this out too the whole idea of this rail system is you you know you put the cabinets together and then you're supposed to kind of install this this railing that the cabinets then kind of click into um, if they're the uppers, and even if they're the base cabinets, it's supposed to keep them all kind of level and, and sort of it, where they're supposed to be. But Rands points out quite wisely that it's based on the idea that your house is totally plumb and square, and nobody's house is like that. Mm -hmm. Well, in general, for IKEA, it's a prerequisite that the walls and the floors and the ceiling are absolutely perfect. That means the floors are horizontal, the ceilings are horizontal and not sacking uh, in the middle, and the walls are flat and vertical. And uh, if you have a house and you've been checking out your own room with uh, a level, you will see that that is not the case. I have never seen a house that was absolutely perfect uh, according to IKEA standards. The this is making me feel a lot better about my actual house, mm -hmm. which is not perfect according to IKEA standards. Um, yeah. So I, I uh, first of all, I would trust Rands with my life. <laughs> That's in I, some ways you are. <laughs> good point. I don't want to get a, um, a quite a substantial uh, a gap uh, on my leg by hitting myself with a rail. Do but we see his face or do we, we do. just see his hands as he We see a picture things. of him. Mm. A lot of it is VO. 
Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of it is just kind of like showing different measurements and yeah. and like things where he's so he's he's kind of filmed it and then he's gone back and recorded the voiceover. We do see him a little bit. He's a, maybe a guy looks like he might be in his fifties, kind of a shaved head. Uh, you know, kind of like oh. looks like a contractor. Possibly, it's. I mean, his his accent makes me think he might be in Europe somewhere, but I don't mm-hmm. actually know where he is. I wasn't sure if maybe he's even Swedish. He might he be. Could, I mean, he yeah. may speak the language. Um, right of ikea exactly. i yeah right. I, I i'm also i'm gonna find this out hopefully by by the end of today's show or no by the end of today i should say but like i'm also i have a um i have a deep concern that they actually sent me the wrong orientation of one of the cabinets and because i put together there's like a really big um it's all called section S E K T I O N. That's the name for the just sort of standard IKEA cabinet. Mm-hmm. And my ska band. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I've got all these cabinets, and I put together like three of them last night. And one of them, which is enormous and has this kind of, it's hard to explain, but it's oriented in this way that it's like a big kind of rectangular box that one part of it doesn't open at all. It's just like it's just like a solid piece of wood. And I think that's the corner piece. Like, in other words, that's for an area that's going to abut the stove. So there's no reason for it to open because it's basically blocked by the side of the stove. Does that make any sense? Yes, like, absolutely. It's the dead space in the corner. It's the yeah. dead space in the corner. But if unless there's something I don't understand about it, it's the exact opposite of what I need. Hmm. Like, it's the wrong orientation. And I may have spent a considerable amount of time assembling this thing that I'm potentially i have to get all of this stuff put together and then try to kind of like place it and go like this goes here this goes here um i i am hoping that i'm totally wrong about this but i have a terrible feeling that this is actually um uh that they i don't know how they would though because it's a very complicated like i said process of like the the three-dimensional design you meet with someone they're putting it all together they're looking at a you know a the floor plan of the room and they're moving things around. It's real, you know, minority report, enhance, 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 et cetera. And they really know what they're doing. So I don't know how it would be that the person would have literally got something opposite unless they like hmm. keystroked it in wrong. I'm, I'm praying that I'm just conf- confused about something, but I, as of right now, can't quite figure out how this piece of cabinetry is supposed to, this big base cabinet is supposed to actually work. Maybe um, a second set of eyes could help, too, because sometimes you just get so close to these things. Genevieve is usually the furniture assembler Mm -hmm. in our house, but sometimes I can choose assembling kind of a piece of cabinetry for our for her upstairs bathroom. This is a couple of years ago now. And um, she just was like puzzling something out and just puzzling something out. And I don't think I mean, I have pretty decent spatial reasoning anyway, but like I want to make it clear she was working on assembling this thing for probably a couple of hours. But there was this one thing that just did not make sense to her about where like the kind of the way that the orientation of the doors opening where the hinge was or something. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you just kind of come in and a fresh set of eyes can be like, OK, flip that upside down. You know what I mean? It sort of yeah. sounds like it could be one of those things. So maybe the next time Walt is there, have him kick the tires. On that yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that I am just not understanding, and I'm terrible with kind of spatial things like this. So I'm very much just hoping that this is me. But um, um, and because again, it's a computerized system. Like they very much knew what they were trying to send me. I'd be surprised if it was the wrong thing. But um, but I guess I just have to call Rands and see what he says. Here I go once again with the email. Every week I hope that it's from a female. Oh man, it's not from a female. How have I been doing on on the sniffle alert? Sniffle watch. Oh, sniffles are fine. Good. Sniffles are fine. Good, at least good. So far as I can I've been tell I've been here. liberally using my um, my mute button to try to keep mm. that sort of stuff at a minimum. I haven't I haven't noticed. I will say our internet line is a little bit um, janky today as well, so it could be slipping through the cracks. And so I'll give you a full report after I listen to Thank the you. final tape Thank today. You. I'll mark every single um, sniffle, and then I'll give you a demerit for good. each one. Good, good. I know that we're a little bit tight on time here, but I'm going to take you on a very short. How do you feel about emotional roller coasters? Um, short, Amer- uh, short emotional roller coasters. I, okay. 
I'm up for we it. We got this from uh, listener Alec. Uh, the, you and I were talking last week. It was a very fun segment. I thought you were introducing me to the world of uh, Club Frog, or is it Frog Club? Frog Club in New York City, New yeah. York City's hottest new uh, restaurant, and they have a whole list of like kind of ways to get 86th from mm-hmm. the restaurant. And it was you know somewhat tongue in cheek, um, and also a little bit haughty. But anyway, Alec said, "Hey, friendos, Alec from Brooklyn checking in. Loved hearing you guys talk about Frog Club, a place my." wife and I are checking out this weekend. So we were talking about this on Friday and this came in on Friday. I had to chime in on the connection that is uh, located. It's located at 86 Bedford Street, one time home of the historic Beat Generation bar slash speakeasy Chumleys. The rumor has it that this is where the idea of being 86 originated because in the speakeasy days when the cops would show up, the bartenders would 86 people by making them sneak out the back door at 86 Bedford Street. Wow. Probably the connection for Frog's cheeky 86 list. Love the show so much. We'll report back with with bathroom selfies of stolen memorabilia <laughs> ASAP. Those are two ways to get 86. Um, I wrote back to Alec I, on Monday. I said, uh, Alec, how, how did it go? Tell us everything about um, Frog Club. And uh, this is the emotional roller coaster part. We ended up getting sick <gasps> and missing the event that we were supposed to go to there the frog gods must have cursed me for my tasteless joke about stealing memorabilia we'll try to get there asap and do some boots on the ground reporting for you all uh best alex so i'm sorry 86 better to 86 andrew oh that's pretty good luke can you tell that i refound my um i i've been Uh unpacking i'm still unpacking here that the little beige one with the red no, top? I lost that one. This uh, is that like one was cute. This is um just this one has actually not much to look at, but I it's mm. got a good listen to this. Yeah, it's got a good ring out. It's got a good nice ring out good to it. Timber, so, yeah, sure. exactly. Um, all right. Well, I think that's going to do it for today's program. But guess what, everyone? We're going to be right back here tomorrow with more imaginary radio for you. Don't forget, Andrew on. Thursday show, you get to use Leap Day William. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right around the corner. Put a pin in that. Yes. All right. Uh, We'll see you tomorrow, everyone. In the meantime, have a great Tuesday. Take care of yourselves. And please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all. Hi, Luke. Hi, Andrew. I am Julian. I am almost nine year old. Nine year old. Nine years old, and I have a funny joke for you. Why? What kind of um shoe does a frog wear? An open toed. Power out. Power out.